John chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, now you can turn to John chapter 2. I'm going to read the first 11 verses. I looked back and in um, the 31 years I've been pastoring here at Cornerstone, I've never specifically taught on this particular story other than on Wednesday nights when we go through the Bible verse by verse on Sundays. I've never, I've never taught on this story. So um, this is taken out of John chapter 2. Uh, verses 1 to 11. And this is the first miracle that is recorded of Jesus' public ministry. John 2 verse 1 says, On the third day, and that only is in reference to the previous chapter where John was talking about different events happening on different days, nothing significant. But on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. I've entitled today's teaching, God has saved the best for last. Let's pray. Lord, it is good to be in your house, and we we're just grateful for the opportunity to gather here freely to worship you, to lift up Jesus, Lord, because you tell us in your word, if Jesus is lifted up, you will draw all men unto yourself. And so we just pray that people would just be drawn to you today as we talk about you and this first miracle that you performed in your ministry. And we just pray that you would be exalted above all things. And we continue to pray for our nation. We just continue to lift up the Supreme Court justices for their protection, for their peace, for their safety. We pray, God, for your continued help as we want to live out our faith in a way that um, are, are as ambassadors of Christ, uh, not just by what we believe, but also by how we behave. And may it be for your glory. Strengthen us now as we open up your word together and look at this passage. We love you in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. As I mentioned in the intro to the Gospel of John last week, uh, John records the fewest number of miracles that Jesus performed. John mentions only eight miracles, but of those eight, six are unique to the Gospel of John, not found anywhere else uh, in the Gospels. And this story that we just read is one of those. Only John records this miracle of the water changing to wine that Jesus performed. And John tells us that it happened to have also been the very first of the miracles that Jesus performed in his public ministry. And so let me just kind of give some highlights of this story first before we unpack it together. The location of this miracle is in a town called Cana. It was located in the region of Galilee. So kind of think of Galilee like, like a county, like Loudoun, and Leesburg is like Cana. So Cana is a town in the province in the region of, of the Galilee, which is, of course, in Israel. And the Hebrew word uh, for Cana is Cana, and Cana means uh, reeds. It means place of reeds. Now, a reed it belongs to the grass family, the tall, slender grasses that typically grow in marshy areas. So part of Cana uh, must have been marshy that it got that name, Cana. Uh, it is also the location of where one of Jesus' disciples was from. His disciple, Nathaniel, uh, was from Cana. John tells us that in John 21, verse 2. 
Uh, Cana is situated about five miles north of Nazareth, which was the town uh, in which Jesus uh, grew up. And today, Cana, and when we go to uh, tour Israel, we drive through Cana, and it is an Arab town today. Uh, it is uh, primarily Muslim, and it is uh, primarily Arabic speaking, and the name of the town today is Kafr Kana. Kafr Kana means village of Cana, or Kana. And today it has a population of about 23,000 people. The scene of this miracle is a, a wedding banquet. There's a wedding, and then the banquet ensues thereafter, and it tells us in the story that Jesus has been invited along with his disciples, and Jesus' mother is also there. Jesus' earthly dad, Joseph, is not mentioned in this story, and it is presumed that he is already dead, that you don't really see any reference to Joseph in the Bible outside of the last time, which Jesus was about 12 years of age when he was last mentioned. So it, it is believed that Joseph died when Jesus was relatively young, and so he's, he's not in this story because he's presumed dead already. Jesus' mother is mentioned in this story, but not by name. She's not mentioned by name, by the, but we know her, of course, as Mary. She's referenced here as simply the mother of Jesus. This miracle that happens here in Cana is the turning of water into wine. That's what Jesus does here. Now, I will tell you that the Roman Catholic Church loves this story. Um, if you Google uh, commentaries on the wedding feast of Cana, the great majority of the answers that come up are from uh, Roman Catholic sources. One of the reasons why the Roman Catholics love this story is because of the significance that Mary plays in this story in persuading Jesus to do this miracle. And the Roman Catholics say that this shows her dual role with Jesus in divine things. Now, I don't agree with that. I'm just telling you that's their perspective. I think probably another reason why the Catholics love this story is the emphasis on wine. You know, it's just... If you have a Catholic background, you know the Catholics love their wine. But anyway, <laughs> you a Wiscopalian shouldn't be laughing. You're not far behind. <laughs> but it is an interesting first miracle that Jesus performs here because nobody gets healed. Nobody's raised from the dead. Nobody is miraculously fed by a couple of loaves and fish. This miracle that Jesus performs seems to be something that he does purely for the enjoyment of the wedding guests and for the enlightenment of his own disciples. Because it tells us at the end of the story in verse 11, and his disciples believed in him. This miracle contributed to the opening of their eyes. But otherwise, that's really the basis of this miracle. For, the, for simply the enjoyment of the wedding guests and the enlightenment of his disciples. And you know, when you stop and think about that, that's encouraging for us to think about because sometimes God performs miracles purely for our pleasure and to help open the eyes of our hearts as to who He is. I suspect that there are countless miracles that God does in our daily lives for those very reasons. Just because He wants to bless us. Just because He loves us and wants to provide and take care of us. I think the reason we often miss Many of those daily miracles is because we're looking for what we think are the big ones. You know, heal my loved one of cancer or save my friend who's an atheist. And that would be a huge miracle if that person ever came to faith. And I think sometimes because we focus on the big miracles and there's nothing wrong with those big miracles, I pray you would continue to pray for those kind of big miracles. But we sometimes miss the other powerful things that God is doing in our daily lives. We're not looking for the ways that He has done powerful things for us. They've often gone unnoticed because we're more focused on what we think are the big miracles. But just like you enjoy blessing your kids if you're a parent, you, you love to bless your kids just because you love them. So does God. So does God. He doesn't bless us on the basis of our performance. He blesses us on the basis of His goodness. This is not a performance-oriented thing. If I just do enough things that make God happy, then maybe He'll bless me with a miracle or two. God delights to show Himself strong, and He does powerful things on behalf of people, not because of our performance, but on the basis of His goodness. He's a good God, and He delights to show His goodness. 
And this is a wonderful miracle in that respect. Nobody has any particular need here. I mean, they've run out of wine. Okay, big deal. You know, there's water, but Jesus is doing this purely for the enjoyment of the marriage guests and the enlightenment of his own disciples. So let's take a look at this story. I'm going to go pretty much verse by verse, and we're going to glean a few things out of this. But in verses 1 and 2, when we start at the top of the story, we see that Jesus and his disciples and Jesus' mother are all at this wedding banquet. Some Bible commentaries suggest that it might have been John's own wedding. Uh, the writer of this gospel is writing about his own wedding. That's the reason why the other gospel writers didn't write about it. John wrote about his own. Um, that, that actually is probably unlikely, but it, it's a possibility. We just don't know. What we do know is that at this wedding banquet, they've run out of wine. And to run out of wine at a wedding banquet in the first century, and particularly this culture, it was a major social embarrassment in this day. You don't, you don't run out of wine. You have guests over, you don't run out of wine. This, this is an embarrassment that could shame this wedding couple for a long time. Everybody would be talking about it. I remember uh, when Terry and I first got married, uh, we, well, it's not like the second time we got married. When we, when we got, <laughs> let, me, let me rephrase that. At the time of our wedding, I was a youth pastor, and uh, we intentionally didn't invite the whole youth group uh, because, you know, we got we to gotta help out with the, uh, the reception afterwards, and we didn't want, you know, a bunch of teenagers eating at the trough and uh, destroying our wedding. So, um, so we just, you know, we invited the people we wanted to be at the wedding. Well, a bunch of the teens from our church just showed up anyway. They're like, hey, Pastor G, hey, we're here to celebrate. Well, I mean, we're not going to turn them away. Well, we ran out of food. We ran out of food at our reception because people came who weren't invited. So I'm still living with the shame of this, you know, all these years later. I'm confessing my own shame to you. Like, we ran out of food. We had uninvited guests. So in this first century, you run out of wine at the wedding party? I mean, like, that's embarrassing. And shame is going to follow you as a, as a young couple. This may have actually been the reason why Mary went to Jesus to do something about it, because maybe she was motivated by the fact that these people are going to be shamed and this isn't a good thing. And so she goes to Jesus and in verse three, she says to him, look at verse three. And, the, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. That's all she says to him. Mary intimates as only a mother can do, right? That's what she's doing here. She doesn't come right out and tell Jesus what to do. She just intimates. She just says to him, they have no more wine. They have no more wine. Now, if you are a son, you know exactly how this goes down at your house. Because your, your mom will intimate things. She won't necessarily come right out and tell you. She will just intimate things. She will say things like, the trash is overflowing. Okay? <laughs> She's intimating, take out the trash. And she goes, the dog is standing at the door again. What is she intimating? Walk the dog, take the dog out. If she says to you, your room is a mess. What is she intimating? Clean up your room. Moms know exactly how to say something without saying something. They're experts at it. You moms know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's what's happening here. Yeah, Mary's a mom. She's an expert at this. So she just goes up to Jesus. She says, they have no wine. They have no wine. That's what she says. Now, we don't honestly know if Mary expected Jesus to do a miracle. Because remember, this is his first miracle. She's never seen him perform one. So it's not like, you know, he's used to doling out miracles. And she goes to him and says, time for another miracle. She's never seen one either. So we don't know if she's going to him asking him to do a miracle or maybe she's just, you know, as a mom, just like, you, you know, you got 12 of your buddies here. Take your posse, go to another town, get some wine and bring it back because we don't have any wine here. We don't really know what she's thinking. She just presents the problem and she is looking to Jesus to do something about it. And he says to her in response in verse four, woman, <laughs> that's what it is right there, woman. What does your concern have to do with me? Now, I got to tell you, if I had ever spoken to my mom, <laughs> even to this day, my mom still, she just uh, turned 86. If I still, even to this day, if I were to ever say to my mom, woman, I'd be slapped from here till Thursday. 
this is not as disrespectful as it looks on the surface, okay? And I'm sure he said it with a tone, because all the ladies have told us many times, guys, it's not what we say, it's how we say it, right? <laughs> so like, you're like, you could be like, woman, you know, or you could be like, woman, you know, that, that's a big difference. That's a big difference. It still sounds a little weird to our ears. Like, why would he call his mom woman? Here's why he called her woman instead of saying mother or mom, because he was respectfully letting her know that the parental bonds were no longer binding, that he was his own man. And in the case particularly of Jesus, the only one calling the shots in Jesus' life is God the Father. So he's, this is actually a respectful term. Instead of calling her mother, he's, letting, he's calling her woman as a way to let her know the parental bonds are no longer binding. I'm a man now. And the inference also is I only take my uh, orders from my Father in heaven. So um, that's why he said what he did. Now the rest of verse 4, he says to her, my hour has not yet come. Uh, some translations say, my time has not yet come. Jesus was always operating on a divine timetable. He was always cognizant of what to do and when to do it, based again on the divine will of, of the Father. And so in effect, between those two sentences there in, in verse 4, Jesus is saying to Mary that their relationship was different now. And that to reveal his power would have to be the will of God the Father, not the wish of Mary, his mother. So he's living by the will of the Father, not by the wish of Mary or anyone else for that matter. So it must have been that in this quick exchange here that Jesus must have, you know, quickly prayed to ask, is this the will of the Father? Because he ends up doing it. And Jesus makes it clear, especially John pens this throughout his gospel, that Jesus only does things according to the will of the Father. I'll give you a few examples. You don't need to turn there. But in John 5, 19, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. In John 5, 30, Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. In John 8, 29, Jesus says, for I always do those things that please him, that please my Father. And so Jesus would only operate based on, is this the will of the Father? Now, Mary comes up with a suggestion, but at some point, it appears that Jesus quickly discerns, is this the will of the Father, before he actually does it, because he only does things now that are certainly the will of the Father. Now, I don't know if Mary anticipated that it would be the will of the Father, um, or if perhaps in this quick exchange, Jesus maybe, he prays, and then he gives his mother kind of a wink and a nod to let her know, thumbs up, the father said, I can do this, so I'm about to do it. But either way, she, she seems to already have an understanding that he's going to do this, because the next thing she says in verse 5 to the servants, she says, whatever he says to you, do it. So she just you know, she says to Jesus, I have no wine. There's this brief moment there, and then she turns to the servants. She says, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. And then Mary walks away. And those are the last recorded words of Mary in the Bible. It's the last thing that she says. It's the last thing recorded that she says. And so in verse 6, it tells us that there were six stone water pots. And each water pot had the capacity to hold 20 to 30 gallons of water. And Jesus told the servants to fill those water pots. And verse 7 says they filled each of them to the brim. Now, there are six of them. You're a smart crowd. If each one can hold 20 to 30 gallons, that means totally there was, there was going to be, when the water changes to wine, anywhere from 120 gallons to 180 gallons of wine. That's a lot of wine. That's a lot of wine. And I don't know how many people were at this wedding banquet, it doesn't say. But I suspect, I'm thinking there's got to be more than 180. Because I can't imagine Jesus serving up a gallon of wine for every person at the party. Unless some were there from Florida State, and then that's understandable. But, oh, come on. 
he just called Catholics and now he's picking on Florida State. No, listen, did you know that nationally, Florida State is ranked as the number two party uh, college in the United States? Next to, does anybody know number one? It used to be West Virginia. They've been replaced by Tulane. Anyway, whatever. So here we go. Back. Come on back. Let me gather my thoughts to the story here. That's a lot of wine. That's where I left off. That's a lot of wine. So I want you to notice here, though, that the miracle is not just about the quantity. That's a lot of wine that was produced there. But it's also about the quality. It's also about the quality, because Jesus says to the servants there in verse 8, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. Who's the master of the feast? That's the wedding coordinator. Nothing's new, friends. Nothing is new under the sun. The master of the feast was a wedding coordinator. Every wedding had a master of the feast, somebody who made sure the guests were fed and the, and the guests had their, their beverages and everything was taken care of. And so Jesus instructs the servants, go, you know, dip out some, take a ladle, take a cup, whatever it doesn't say, take it to the master of the feast. Now, the master of the feast is not aware that Jesus has performed this miracle. We know by his response and his reaction, it's in verses 9 and 10. Take a look in your Bibles at verses 9 and 10. It says, when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And verse 10, and he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. Now, I find this funny. I, you know, as I'm reading this, it's like, okay, this wedding coordinator comes right out and exposes an ancient wedding trade secret, which is you always bring out the good stuff first. Get everybody liquored up, bring out the good stuff, and then they're, they're going to be so wasted, you can bring out the cheap stuff, and they won't know, and they won't care because they're already wasted. That's what he's saying here. And he's saying, but here's what's odd. He says to the groom, he says, what's odd is you've saved the best for last. You've brought out the good wine at the very end. And the groom, it doesn't say, but I imagine the groom's like, yeah, I, I have. Yeah, yeah, I have. Have I? Wait, what? Because he probably doesn't know what's happening either. And so they have this little dialogue. And verse 11 says that this was the first of Jesus' signs. Now, the Greek word is simeon, and it also translates miracles. This is the first of his signs, or his miracles. And again, his disciples believed in him when they saw this miracle. They understood he is supernatural. There's something very divine about him. Now, I want to point out a couple of things from this story as, as important takeaways. First, I want you to consider the vessels that, that Jesus chose to use to perform this miracle. Now, think about this. They had run out of wine. So whatever vessels had been used to serve the wine were still there, just empty. Why is it that Jesus didn't take the empty wine jars or jugs or, or wine skins? Typically, actually, in those days, they were kept in, in animal skins. They were used as uh, wine skins. Um, why didn't Jesus just tell the servants, gather up all the empty bottles or, or jars or jugs or wine skins, bring them to me? And, and then the miracle happened within those vessels. I think because it's no coincidence, Jesus chose, instead of just refilling the empty vessels, he chose these six particular stone water pots. Now, if you'll notice again in your Bibles in verse 6, it tells us what these water pots were used for. They were used for uh, containing water that was used for purification. The Jews put a high premium on ceremonial ritual baths because they um, understood that God was a holy God and they wanted to uh, consecrate themselves externally uh, in, in approaching and worshiping a holy God. So they often would take ritual baths and they would make sure that their bodies were washed and cleansed. These six water pots were used for that purpose. They, specifically, it's told these are water pots of purification. So part of the ritual ceremonial washings that the Jews would engage in, these pots were used for in containing water for that purpose. And Jesus selects those particular pots. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the water from those pots, and that's where I'm going to do my miracle. Now, this is not coincidental. Why? 
because I think Jesus is symbolizing something here, all right? The water in those water pots were used for Jewish purification ceremonies. What is wine often symbolic of in the Bible? Especially in the New Testament, blood. In particular, Jesus' blood. Remember, we're about to celebrate communion here at the end of today's service. The bread symbolizes the body of Jesus. The cup or the wine or the grape juice symbolizes the blood of Jesus. So it isn't, isn't it interesting, I don't think it's coincidental, that of all the vessels that would have been there empty, Jesus says, no, I'm going to use these purification vessels. Why? Because he's communicating a message that external cleansing only does so much. The real cleansing that every single one of us needs is in the heart. And the cleansing of the heart can only come through the blood sacrifice of Jesus who offered his life on a cross. I think this is very intentional. I'm going to select those pots. We're going to take that water that is used typically for external uh, cleansing. And we're going to replace it with wine, a symbol of his blood that he would shed on the cross for the internal cleansing of the human soul. And so he, he, he makes that decision there. And besides all the other nuances of a Jewish wedding and the interesting exchange between Jesus and his mother and the fact that this was the first miracle that Jesus performed, the thing I like most about this story is the way that the master of the feast commends the bridegroom for saving the best for last. Because I think that it paints a beautiful picture of how God operates, how God always chooses to save the best for last. You see, someone who doesn't know Jesus in a personal way, to someone who doesn't know Jesus in a personal way, this life is as good as it gets. To those of us who know Jesus in a personal way, this life is as bad as it gets. The best is yet to come. God has saved the best for last. Years ago, I remember when Joel Osteen came out with one of his books, and it was entitled, It's Your Best Life Now. Um, <laughs> not really. I remember when I saw the title, I just thought, uh, no, it's not. It's not my best life now. This is my worst life now. As a believer, I think it would be more accurate to entitle a book, It's Your Worst Life Now, and then subtitle it, But God Has Saved the Best for Last. Because that's really the Christian perspective. This life is full of difficulties and heartaches, betrayal, remorse and regret for things we've done and things done to us. There is divorce. There's death, there's disease, there is physical and emotional pain and suffering. Sorrow can run deep like a river. Children get hurt and abandoned. People lie, cheat, steal, murder. We are both the offender and the offended in life. And Jesus comes along to save us from our sins and to rescue us from a sinful world. Because the best is saved for last so that we can ultimately experience the prize of knowing him and spending for an ever and ever with him. The first miracle of Jesus occurs at a wedding banquet. And the last mention of a wedding banquet in all of the Bible is the one that Jesus has prepared for us who know him. It's in Revelation chapter 19 where it speaks about the wedding banquet of the Lamb, where Jesus is both the Lamb and the groom in this future banquet to come. I'll share the verses on the screen with you. It's Revelation 19, 6 to 9. John writes, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife or his bride has made herself ready. That's us. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, the Lord speaking to John, write 
Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper, the wedding banquet of the Lamb. Okay, first miracle Jesus performs is at the occasion of a wedding banquet. The last reference to wedding banquet in the Bible is the one that Jesus has prepared for us. He is the lamb in that story of Revelation 19. He's the one who sheds his blood and dies on a cross for our sins that we might be able to enter into a relationship with him. And he's the groom in the story at the same time. He has pursued us with his love. He's gone after us to redeem us that we might enter into an eternal relationship with him. We are the bride of Christ, those who know him. We are the bride. We have made ourselves ready so that there will be a glorious day when either we will die and go to be with him because we know him, or he comes again to receive us unto himself. Either way, those who know Jesus as Lord and Savior, be prepared to enter into a wedding banquet like no other you've ever been to. And Jesus is seated at the center of that banquet table as our Lord, as our Lamb, as the groom who died to rescue his bride from a sinful world. Give God praise. And those who know him now will join him then at his banqueting table forever and ever in relationship with Jesus. This world is not our home. We are only passing through. This life is not our best. So don't get discouraged and don't give up because God has saved the best for last. Amen.